Hello, Redemption Tucson. We're the Nebuchadnezzar. Let's talk about marriage. Denise, if there was one word that could sum up the heart and soul of marriage, what would that one word be? Well, I think that you and I both would say that the word oneness seems to sum up God's heart for marriage from what we can see in the scriptures. Okay. Uh, does that mean, does oneness mean like get along well, you don't argue very much, you kind of like the same things, you have the same ideas, same beliefs? Is that kind of what we mean by oneness? Well, it could be manifested that way, but I think the real uh, part of oneness is a growing trust between two people. Does that mean like you trust your spouse, you're not going to commit on that? adultery on you kind of trust or what kind of trust are you talking about i think it means a lot more than just that that certainly is a wonderful basis if you feel that you can trust your spouse to be faithful to you physically um then of course that gives you a certain level of safety but safety is needed in far um, wider definition than just that oneness means that two people are growing in their ability to um, have each other's backs and to, mm. to help each other to feel safe emotionally with one another. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's pretty helpful. Um, you have counseling experience. Um, what are some maybe false views of oneness that Christians hold to? Well, I think one of the things that I see that we're all susceptible to is feeling that we'll have the oneness, we'll have the connection, if I can just get you to understand what I'm trying to say, if I can just open your head and pour in some information, like, well, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, and if you can just get that, if I can just make you get that, then we'll be okay. Or if I try to explain to you why I did something, and you see that my view of something, or you see my view of something, if I can get you to see my view of something is right, I'm gonna feel like I'm more lovable. Okay, so like, you need to just believe, what I believe, and we'll get along and we'll be one. Yeah, I think that in most marriages, each partner has at some point been guilty of trying to just get the other person to see something. But typically all that does is makes us feel manipulated, not connected. Ah, uh, yes, yes. It's one of the reasons I would say that, you know, you and I both love working with couples in developing skills, communication skills, and knowing how to do good problem solving and conflict resolution, but those skills um, don't make for an, a, two engaged hearts. Mm. Those skills are very helpful with two hearts are engaged. When mm -hmm. you feel safe with your partner, even though you may have a very different view of something. Um, so I think that oneness, it, oneness grows as we keep the, um, forsaking our uh, need to get the other person to see something our way, and we practice um, asking good questions, being curious of the other person, so we can see how we can come together on the things that we need to come together on. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's really helpful, because, you know, when I think of trust, it's like um, maybe I think of the word reliability or the word dependable. And so can I depend on my wife uh, to get me those ribs I wanted? Or can I depend on my husband to empty the dishwasher like I asked him? We're talking about that when we talk about trust, but it goes deeper than that. It's like, can I trust my spouse to come through emotionally for me so that I don't feel alone? Is that what you're getting at? That's a lot of it. Um, I think we're always asking, whether we can identify it or not, we're always asking about our spouse. Are you really there for me? Do I matter that much to you? Uh, am I really the most important person in your life? Do you have my back? Uh, am I safe here? Mm. And I would say that um, most marriages fall into what you and I would call maybe three different yes. um, categories. Satisfying marriages, 
And there can be a range of how much satisfaction, but for generally for two people who feel like we have a marriage that's very satisfying to us, then uh, we don't tend to do marriage coaching with those people because yeah. they're satisfied. Then there are people with disappointing marriages. And I guess we would say there's two types of disappointing marriages. There are disappointing marriages that um, where people really do need to understand better how to listen to one another and how to engage one another and how to build that trust. But there are also, um, under disappointing marriages, there are destructive relationships, destructive marriages. If that's what you're a part of, uh, the principles for marriage have to be applied somewhat differently. And as everyone needs help, if you have a level of disappointing marriage or places that are disappointing in your marriage, all of us need community. All of us need people who can help us just to hear each other and to see each other. But if you are involved in a destructive marriage, you will not be able to navigate that well by yourself. Mm -hmm. You desperately need people to support you and help you understand what that calls you to do. Mm -hmm. So, Denise, sometimes, and I've learned this from you, um, with disappointing marriages and destructive marriages, you cannot just use skill building, right? Well, if we're not really two people who are engaged in um, engaging each other's hearts, loving the other person, trying to understand how to meet needs, then um, we will just learn skills to use them to control the other oh. person. So much of the time when you and I work with others on skills, it's for the purpose of looking beneath the skills and why these skills have not already been applied. Um, but like we were saying, skills are great when you have a safe commitment to each other. When you feel safe with your partner and your partner feels safe with you emotionally, um, then skills can be used to help further that oneness. Yes. But when skills are learned uh, and they're just used to control the other person, that isn't very helpful. Denise, as I have um, thought about it over the years, it seems to me oneness at its best in marriage is based really upon our oneness with Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, union with Christ is the bedrock of oneness in marriage. And what I mean by that is in the teaching of the Apostle Paul and other New Testament writers, when we become believers in Jesus, we are immediately joined to Jesus. And even the Apostle Paul says it's like marriage in Ephesians 5, this union with Christ that the, the believer has with Jesus. And so if your union with Christ is not nurtured, not tended to, not embraced, not celebrated, that has huge effects on your marriage, doesn't it? Well, of course it does. If we're um unable to apply the gospel to how we see ourselves and how we see our spouse. We won't be operating from a, a solid identity um, from our understanding of the gospel. Mm -hmm. That I don't have to get everything right, but I do want to keep growing in my understanding of how to love uh, my spouse and other people mm -hmm. because that's what Jesus affords us by dying for us. Yes. Yes, that's the point there is how do I sacrifice in the way Christ did for my spouse? But I, I can't do that, but I'm just going to try harder to live more sacrificially. It's our union with Christ, the strength he provides, the identity we have. Living out of that is the best way that I can love my spouse. Hmm. There's another thing that I think is worth talking about, Denise, and it's the idea of attachment. Um, the best attachment, the ultimate attachment that humans have is not their attachment to the spouse, but the best attachment is our attachment to Christ. Uh, that's the deepest longing of the human soul. And so I'm intrigued by Genesis chapter 2 where Moses says, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, 
And Paul reiterates that in Ephesians 5. I always believed, Denise, that that leaving meant, you know, you leave, you cleave, it's a done deal, you're good. But it seems to me that cleaving is a process, isn't it? Attaching is a process. I think leaving is also a process. Of course, we make a decision to leave our families uh, as our primary commitment and, and attachment. And then we make a commitment on a wedding day. We make it public that we're going to um, cleave to the person that we're married to. But um, it takes a, a while to learn for a lot of couples what the leaving really means and what the cleaving means. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think both of those, like many things in life, are things that we keep learning as we grow. As we go, mm-hmm. We're learning an un, a, a, a deeper understanding of union with Christ as we grow, mm-hmm. a deeper understanding of our union with our spouse and how to understand um, the person we've made that commitment to. But I do think that that is a point that leaving and cleaving is both a one-time event and a process of growing. Oh, yes. Well said. Well said. Denise, um, as we begin to wrap this little video up, what do you think would be a good exercise for a couple, whether they've been married three weeks or 50 years, what's a good exercise for a couple to develop deeper trust in one another? That is a great question. I think there are a number of things you could do, but one of the things I find to be the most helpful is if we are willing to um, ask our spouse, what is it that you need from me that you're afraid I don't really understand? Mm -hmm. Now, the reason we don't just naturally ask those questions of our spouse is the same reason we don't ask questions of a lot of other relationships with us is we're a little afraid of what the answer is. Oh, what yeah. if I ask you that and then you need something from me that I don't know that I can give? Mm-hmm. That's the reason we're not more curious that rather than just trying to pour, open the other person's head and pour information in that will help us get along better. Um, wait, the reason we're not more curious, which is a better way to communicate is because We kind of stay away from the things that we're afraid we don't know how to do or we don't know what like the answer. And I would say if you're if you hear this exercise of asking your spouse, what is it that you need from me that you feel like I don't completely understand, but I want to. um, If you're a bit afraid this is going to start an argument, create more conflict, um, you really do need the help of a third person to Mm -hmm. help you with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you would like to contact us, we have resources, talk to the pastors. Um, we all need help at times, even to communicate with the closest person to us. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that a growing ability to ask those kinds of questions of one another uh, really sets a, a, a stronger foundation for the kinds of things that are going to come our way that we're going to have to learn how to solve. Mm-hmm. One of the things I'm discovering as we think about this whole issue of trust and attachment and oneness is trust is such a basic thing. You know, it's like, well, trust and obey. There's no other way. But really trust in our marriage and in our relationship with God is something that has to develop all our lives long. It's not just, hey, I'm trusting. We're good to go. Yeah. I think that it's easy to feel like we need to convince the other person to trust us by mm. by telling them. Mm-hmm. But if I've hurt you really badly, hmm. um, then trust isn't going to be built because I reason with you that now I understand and I'll never do what I did again to hurt you. You need to see that I am willing to um, do the work it takes to rebuild the trust. Uh, yes. Well, like Denise said, if you need a tune-up in your marriage, grab a pastor, reach out to us. If you find yourself in a disappointing marriage, reach out to the pastors or to us. And the same if you find yourself in a destructive marriage. But we look forward to having more of these sorts of conversations with you in the days ahead.